All right, raise your hand if you have ever heard the term side quest. All right, okay, okay. I'm, I'm impressed. It's a lot of people. It's kind of a video game thing these days, right? If you're not sure what a side quest is, it, a lot of times it's, it kind of comes across as like, oh, I'm wasting my time. It's a distraction. You got the main mission, you're going, you're in Zelda or wherever you're playing, and you're trying to get to the end of the, the cave and get your treasure, and then, oh, over here, side quest, diversion. You got to do something, right? Well, many of you remember last week, I shared a, uh, a little bit about our father-son retreat that Milo and I had the privilege to go on, and something I learned down in that cave is one does not simply ignore side quests. They're there for a reason. And uh, I got a picture of us. This is, this, this is the last time we were seen alive. And right there it is on breaking news. And we're, we're in this cave and I'm all beat up. We've gone through some stuff. And you're going to hear a big story here in just a minute. I promised I would share it. I don't want to. It's a little painful, a little vulnerable, but I'm going to share it in a minute. But this one's a good one. And it's one that actually kind of, it's a bittersweet thing because we're going through these caves and we're having this great time. We're touring and we're seeing, we're getting beat up. I'm cut up. I'm bleeding. I'm, my hat's on sideways. And we get to this one chamber and the guy looks and goes, now, who wants to see something really cool? And I'm like, is it the surface? Is it, <laughs> can we just go to the top? And like, no, you got to crawl. We, you've walked right by. You didn't even know it's a hidden side quest. There's a cave halfway up the wall. You kind of had to go around some stalagmites and get in there and go do some stuff and only a few brave people agreed to go, and Milo was one of them. And he slithered up that rock and just kind of snaked out of sight, and <laughs> I never saw him again. It, it, it went on for a while, and it was this very tight thing. He later would describe it. And you slither around, there's about, I don't know, seven or eight people maybe went with you, maybe half the group. And after he was gone for a while, I'm, I'm not nervous, but I'm like, man, what is taking so long? And then, one by one, because he only fit one at a time, they come popping out of this cave and dropping and somersaulting and standing up and brushing themselves off. He looked at me, and he comes running up, and he says, Dad, that was amazing. I wish you would have gone. I mean, he, he, was, he lit up <clears throat> to talk about this cave. And I'm like, what, is, what could possibly be? It's just a bunch of rock, right? Just a bunch of dirt. I've seen enough. I've been ready to go for an hour. And he is, comes up, and then he says, Dad, seriously, it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And I said, all right, son, what did you see? And he said, it's surreal. I don't know how it happened. I can't even describe it. But it was as if someone took the Wizard of Oz golden yellow brick road and dropped it inside this cave. He said, we're sitting here crawling through. we got this little headlamp on. And when it panned over, this golden road lit up that should not be there. And apparently the orange-brown dust of all these years had settled onto these water-worn smooth rocks and it settled in these cracks and it formed like, looked like English cobblestone paved with gold. And I'm like, does it look like Oz? He's like, that's it. So we looked at pictures like, is this the closest? He said, this is it. And he described it in such a manner that it, it almost made me wish I had gone. <laughs> almost. <laughs> right? And I got to thinking about that. What was it that was so special to him that he came out? Something lit a, a fire. When we were driving home, and like it was a rough trip home. I mean, we, were, we caught it like a bug down there, and we were starting to feel rough. And, you know, I was gone for a week in here. And he said, Dad, I tell you what, of all the things we did, this is the one thing that was awe-inspiring enough I would do it all again for that scene. And that, that blew my mind. I'm like, really? Of all, you would go through all the stuff you're about to hear in a minute. And he said, I would. It was that power. And then I started thinking, what about us? What about me? When we think of things of the Lord, when is the last time we were that filled with awe and wonder that it was all worth it? That we start thinking about the majesty and the awe of our incredible creator, and it moves us, and it grabs our heart, and we come out, and we light up, and we tell, you won't believe what I've seen. When was the last time we were wide-eyed with wonder, right? Right? <laughs> I hope we never lose the awe and wonder of our Creator. I, I just read this great article from Eric Raymond. He wrote it for pastors, and he said this. Pastor, don't be content to just give your hearers a nice guided tour through a passage, connecting the dots and going through the motions. Rather, show the glory, the grandeur, the greatness, the wonder of God so that they can join you in marveling at the glorious view. And then he said, I want to be the preacher who is not merely content to glide along the surface of the biblical ocean, just telling my friends, hey, there's great treasures that lie under the boat. 
But instead, I want to dive down into the depths of the water and see it for ourselves, to marvel, and then come up and cry out with seaweed on our shoulders as one who has seen something for themselves. This is who God is. This is what Christ does for our souls. And that resonated with me. I love it. It is so easy to stay sterile and clean and not covered with the dust. But that's not where the treasure lies. Today, I want us to dive deep into God's ocean and come up with seaweed drenched all over us, soaked to the core, saying, isn't God awesome? The wonder, the majesty, may we never lose that. Have we? Have some of us? It's okay if you have. You are in the right place. If this is kind of already going over your head, going to the majesty and glory of God, Pastor, I just like barely put my pants on today. That's a good day. I didn't fall over. You're in the right place. Today, you are not here by accident. If you're watching online, welcome, streaming. You are not finding us by accident. God has such an awesome word for us today. We're going to be in Psalm 139. You can pull that up if you want. We're going to start in the NKJV version. And if you're a guest here in the big room, Pastor Mike, great to have you and your wife with us today as well. Thanks so much for being with us today, brother. God has got something fantastic for us. And we're looking at Psalms. Today's probably the end of our summer in the Psalms. And we never really address where we got the word Psalms from. But it's actually a Hebrew word, and it's where we get the word praises, tehillim, and it means praises or book of praises. And the, the Greek word is psalmos, and that's where we get our word psalm from, which means song. So when you put it together, this is Israel's hymnal. This is their praise book. This is their songs of worship. And we come together and we sing these, and back in the day, they were actually played most often on a psaltery, which is that stringed instrument that you always see in these old medieval paintings. And David a man after God's own heart. Most scholars say he wrote half of these songs, including the one today. And this is one of my all-time favorites. Every few years, I love to reread this and dip back into it and see what God has shown me because there's new truths in here. This is so amazing. All right, so follow along, starting in verse one. <clears throat> we'll read this verse by verse. Oh Lord, you have searched me. You've known me. You know my sitting down. You know my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path. And my lying down, you are acquainted with some of my ways. Ooh, all? Yikes. I don't know if that brings me joy or terror. You are acquainted with all my ways. This is one of my favorite songs. I love how David is so filled with wonder here at the timeless depth of God's mercy. And, and O.S. Hawkins brilliantly wrote once, he was breaking down this whole chapter, and he said you can actually break this down verse by verse like this. God's omniscience is dealt with in verses 1 through 6. If you're taking notes, this is an awesome Bible study to go back and explore deeper. Then he moves on into verse 7, and he starts focusing on God's omnipresence. And we're going to break that down. And you'll see in verses 13 through 18, David shifts his view to God's omnipotence. And we're going to look at that word. What does that really mean for our life today? And then lastly, there's another O word, but it's one that we don't like to say much, and it's David's obedience. Ooh. How are you doing with obedience to the Spirit? If you've ever been around kids, maybe you have young kids or you, you, you have children or you've been around, maybe you've got grandkids, you will quickly notice they have a sense of wonder and a sense of awe. Everything is fresh and new and they walk around wide-eyed and I love their inquisitive minds and as they explore the world around them, their favorite question seems to be, why? <laughs> How come? Why is that? And they go on and on and I love that they're not jaded yet. Everything is still so intriguing and amuses them. And right now, our, our little daughter, Mercy, is still looking at the world in wide-eyed wonder. And she is all into unicorns right now. I don't know what it is, but she absolutely loves unicorns. They're on her door. They're on her notebook. They're on her Bible journal. And this week, she came up to me, and she was so excited. She said, Daddy, Daddy, oh, this is so great. And she's, she was just giddy. She could barely talk, right? She goes, ah, I found a unicorn. Do you want to see it? I'm like, I mean, yeah, who doesn't want to see a unicorn, right? So she says, all right, close your eyes, and I want you to bend down. Well, that makes any man nervous when a little girl comes up and says, close your eyes, and then bend down in front of them. So I've, I've closed my eyes, and she says, okay, bend down, are you ready? And I said, yes, baby. She said, are you ready to see the unicorn? I said, show me the unicorn. And she says, louder. I said, show me the unicorn. And all of a sudden, she hits me, and she, she, puts, she puts her toothbrush on my forehead. 
And then she goes, you're the unicorn. You're the unicorn, Daddy. And she just started laughing and had a great time. She was so amused, even if I wasn't. And I looked at her and I thought, you know what? She still sees the world in eyes of wonder. She still has this awe. And she, is this still there? Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, we'll put that right there. And that's just going to flash for a few minutes. I'll let you know you're done brushing your teeth when that's done. And I got to thinking, gosh, that's what I love about David is he hasn't lost his sense of wonder. He hasn't lost his sense of awe and everything still intrigues him. And he expresses his heartfelt wonder. And I think the very first thing he is telling us today, church, never lose the awe of God's omniscience. This is just a fancy word that simply means God knows absolutely everything. In those first few verses that we read, did you notice five times he says God knew him. This is a knowing from top to bottom. This is like, oh, yeah, hey, I know Bob. I know Jimbo. Yeah. No, no, no. He knows him. He says, oh, Lord, look, you have searched me. You've known me. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You know all my ways. Gasp. For there is not a word on my tongue before you know it altogether. And we think, oh, okay, so God knows when we sit down. God knows when we stand. Woo-hoo, big deal. No, no, no. Don't gloss over that. That is an Old Testament expression that was common back then. We've lost the meaning of that. He is saying today, that means our normal everyday routine, everything you do, everything you go through, whether you're at work, whether you're at home, whether you're alone or you think no one sees, he is there. He is watching. When you're asleep, when you're resting, he sees and knows everything about us and he cares for every detail of our life. So when David writes, you understand my thoughts from afar, he's saying, I'm overwhelmed. God, you overwhelm me. You know everything, the size and scope of your, your uh, everywhereness, to make up a word, is mind-blowing. So I got to pause here and ask, what about us? When is the last time we were so blown away with God's awe and his wonder and his omniscience that it took our breath away? When's the last time we were crawling through that cave and we saw an unexplainable golden yellow brick road that should not be there? And we stop and say, praise you, Lord. Your works are magnificent. I don't know about you, but it's not as often as I hope it would be. Be encouraged. You have a chance to change that, to have a heart like David. You know everything about me. He knows what you do. He knows what you think. He knows where you go. He knows what you say. He knows what you need. So David's trying to grasp the extent of God's knowledge, and he's becoming overwhelmed. And this isn't just an Old Testament thing. Fast forward another 1,000 or 1,500 years, you go into the New Testament. The apostle Paul says the exact same thing. Look with me. He says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. We can't even find them out. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is an amazing God. Do you sense that daily? What, what God knows everything. He knows your email. He knows your Instagram account. He knows your social security, your phone number. He knows your Facebook password, which means he knows all of your private messages. <laughs> he has access to your hidden photo folder. He knows your browsing history. Oh, just going to let that sit there a minute. I'll let that soak in. And he still loves you. And he still says, you're my child. He knows everything. Guys, that should stop and blow our minds. He knows your worries. He knows what you're anxious about right now. He knows what your mind continually goes to even right now, and you have to chase it back. He knows your doubts. He knows your fears. He knows your struggles. And he knows your dreams and your joys and your victories and your celebrations and your goals. He knows everything. Are you in awe of that at all? You can change that. Everything we did was new. I remember we bought our first new house, and we were so excited. And, you know, uh, we brought our mom and dads up. You got to come see this. I got to give you the tour of my 1,100 square foot mansion is just massive. Y'all, it has two bedrooms. We don't even know what to do with the second one, right? And you remember when you're new and you're in love and you, you go by that house and like you, you, everything's new because you haven't bought anything? 
And like we, we bought our first comforter set that matched, even had those goofy round long pillows that I still don't know what they do, look like little sausages. Right? Everything's fresh. Like, oh, baby, it's our first toilet plunger. This is so exciting, right? Everything's new. And we had our parents come up. We didn't have hardly anything in the house. And I remember looking at my dad. I'm giving him a tour. I'm like, so, Dad, we're going to do it all 220, 221. And uh, we're looking. He says, where are you going to put your furniture? And I'm like, well, we don't have much. But I think I'm going to put my bed over here and the nightstand. We'll put the TV on this wall. And he goes, you can't do that. I said, Yes, I can. It's my house. I'm the castle king here in my domain. He says, no, you can't put your bed there because your nightstand's got to go over here. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, if you look up, there's no light. Okay? This is an early house, so that means everything's controlled by a lamp. Do you have a lamp? I'm like, I got a lamp. He goes, go get a lamp. So I go in under him, unbox the lamp. I come run it in. He goes, go plug it into that wall over there. I'm like, okay. And I said, this is not where my nightstand's going to go. My bed's not going to go. I've already got it mapped out. I know what I'm doing. You're a dad. No offense, but you don't know nothing. And I'm going through this. And he says, watch this. And he goes over to the light switch. And he says, I bet that lamp's coming on. And I turn it on, and the lamp lit up. And I looked at him, and I said, teach me. <laughs> oh, Jedi master. How could you possibly know that that? And he says, son, he says, that's the only sock out of all these that's upside down. A lot of builders put it in upside down. They know that's the one that controls this light switch. And that's where you're going to have to put your night stand and your bed's going to go there. And I was blown away because he was omniscient. In my mind, he knew everything. Do you remember when your kids looked up to you? And then they became teenagers. And suddenly you knew nothing. And they got older and you got smart again right? When is the last, how much more so with God do we marvel in his omniscience, the creator who is truly wise, who truly knows everything? And I think sometimes we enter his presence just casually be bopping in, so flow up a little prayer, sing a little worship song, and we don't get blown away by his omniscience. He is everything. I think the second lesson that he has right here is he's telling us, church, don't lose the awe of the Lord's omnipresence. This is a fancy word for his everywhereness, right? When he's looking at the mind-blowing truth, David says, where can I go from your spirit? And look what he tries. He says, if I go to heaven, you're there. If I go into the depths, you're there. Your Bible may even say Sheol, which is translated as the grave or the place of the dead. But in this instant, he's not referring to the, the lake of fire, the eternal punishment place. He's using a very specific Hebrew word that actually he's saying, everywhere you go, including death, cannot separate the believer from the Lord. Even death has lost its grip. For those who know the Savior, he is saying, you can go nowhere where he is not present. God is there. I promised you I would share what happened in that cave. And I don't want to. <laughs> but I must. We were probably two hours into our tour that was two hours too long already. And we were slithering through, and then we got into this one chamber that was probably about for me to lead, just this little circle. We're all at 13 of us guys. And he says, all right, I need you all to reach up and do the unthinkable. I need you to turn off your headlamps. Ooh. That is the first and only time you will ever experience true 100% darkness. 100%. You can have your eyes open. You're doing It plays with your head, y'all. You start hearing stuff that ain't there. You start seeing stuff that is not real. And it starts freaking out. He says, all right, here's what we're going to do. I need you to put your hands on the shoulders of the person in front of you, and I want you to form kind of a line. So we're in the road. This is, this is not level stuff, so we're like, okay. And he says, we have to get into the next chamber, but you're going to have to do a little crawling through a tight space. <sighs> okay. All right. We had one guy with us who was petrified, full-blown claustrophobia, and you could hear him start to breathe. And he's like, guys, I can't do this. I'm like, hey, you got this. You got it. Was it Steve? Do you remember his name? Mr. X. Chris? Okay. His name was Chris. And we're like, Chris, you got this, buddy. I mean, we just met him the day before. And big guy, my size, and he's, he's like one of the first ones to go. And I'm like, man, if this guy's freaking out. Like, I'm going to tell you something, guys. Fear is contagious. Did you know that? It started to go through this line. We're, no, it's pitch black. We're just holding on. I'm like, Milo, you good? He's like, yeah. And the guy says, all right, we're going to have to pray for Chris. So we stopped, and we gathered up. We prayed for Chris. Chris, you got this. The Lord will get you through, right? And I'm like, you know, deal with it, dude. What's the big deal? 
So we go, the lights are out, the guide's leading us through, and then we stop. And one by one, the guide, there's one in the very front, and there's one at the very back. He's right behind me, the last guide and the first. We get to this wall, and he says, when you get to the wall, I'm going to tell you, just feel your way down, and then eventually you're going to feel this opening into this little tunnel passageway. You're going to have to crawl through that. He used the word crawl. He should not have used the word crawl. What he meant to say was slither. So we're going, so they're going through, and it's taking forever. I'm last in line. Milo's here, and we're going through, and as it goes, you start hearing these guys struggle, and they're sli- now they're slithering, right? So this isn't like army crawling, like, oh, it's a little, it's like, oh, I bumped my head. It is down here, and you're having to crawl through, and your arms are in front of you like Superman, and you're using your fingertips to slither, like you're putting on a tight sweater, like big guy in a little coat, and you're sitting here trying to get through, and your toes are kicking to try to get you to, there is no room. I didn't know this yet. So I'm like, yo, what is it taking so long? Oh. So we get finally close enough, and I feel Milo disappear, and he squats down. And now I'm all alone. And I pray a prayer for Milo. Okay, Lord, you got him. You can get him through. The- He's skinny. This ain't going to be a problem. <clears throat> but bless, bless him, Lord. So he goes through, and I kind of hear him, and then eventually you start hearing the shuffling kind of subside as he's down inside this tunnel. And then everybody's in the other chamber, lights off, waiting in complete silence. We're not allowed to talk, not allowed to say anything. And then the guide puts his hand on my shoulder and says, okay, Matt, reach out and feel the wall in front of you. I feel the wall. He says, just run your hands down. You're going to find the opening. I'm like, okay. I don't find the opening. He says, it's lower. There's no opening. He says, Matt, you're going to have to get down on your knees. I'm like, oh, okay. So I get down, and I still can't find the opening. It is on the ground, eight inches up. And he said, your, your head's not going to fit <laughs> unless you turn your head sideways. Your helmet is going to get stuck. So I'm like, okay, all right. Everybody's made it. They're all waiting on me now. Pitch black. I turn my head, and I'm starting to slither in, and I'm just like, this has to be the worst moment of my life. And I was wrong. So I'm going and I'm doing my little snake slither, trying to get in. And the cave I thought was tight starts to close in. And I start feeling it now on my back and my stomach to where it's doing this and the, the walls this way. So you could kind of do this, but it started to get tight on the sides. And I'm like, I think I'm going to get stuck. You know, but it wasn't funny. So I'm like, I'm look, I, can't, I can't look. There's nowhere to look anyway. It's pitch black, and I'm doing this, and I hear everybody's in. They're waiting on me. Now I'm starting to be like, all right, come on, chubby. Get in here. Let's go. And I'm slithering, and I'm trying to go forward. I'm going somewhere spiritual with this guy. It's going to blow your mind. And finally, I was like, the only way I'm going to get through this is if I exhale my hair and make me as skinny as I can, and I'm just going to try to shoot through this to the room. So I exhale, and I go forward, and it gets narrower and I get stuck. But I have exhaled all my air. So I go to inhale, and I, my rib cage will not expand. So this is what I hear. I thought I knew what a panic attack was. Never had one. Kind of really wasn't sure what the big deal was. I met a new friend down in that cave. People say they came in to go conquer all their fears. or closet. I came out with new fears I didn't know I had. <laughs> and I was sitting there breathing, and I was like, <gasps> and I can't cry for help. He's too far behind me. They're way, they don't know what's happening. It's pitch black, and I'm thinking, this is it. This is how your pastor dies. In this cave, and they're not going to know it. They're going to have to send, like, the, the high priest, like, a rope on the ankle and pull him out or something from the front. But, so, so all this is racing about how do I get out? How do they get me out? If I yell for help, do they even know if they come get and get, pull me forward? I'm stuck that way. I'm jammed in this way. Like, it was hopeless. And all this washed over me in a second. And I'm like, Lord, you are going to have to do something. I kid you not. A shaft of light shines into this tunnel. And I can't turn my head, but I see up ahead 
the slightest depression in this cave where it drops only one inch, but it's about as wide as my rib cage. And it's about as long as my body. And I look at this, and I'm sitting there trying to turn my head, and I see it, and I'm out of breath, and I'm going, <sighs> and I knew if I could just get into that slight little depression, I would be okay. I don't know, I don't know who's turning on this light in my mind. I'm thanking that guy behind me. He must have known. God must have whispered to his soul, old dude's about to die. <laughs> You need to shine on the light so he can see that he's going, you got to go right. There's no way you're going to fit left. You've got to go. There's a slight depression. So I go into it, y'all. My body drops one inch into it. And I, <gasps> it was the most relief. It felt like heaven in this dark, dusty, stinky cave. And I gasped air. And I was able to make my way finally out that tunnel into the cave. And then the light shut off. I'm sitting here in this cave. People are silent. We're supposed to not say a word. And then I hear the guide slither up behind. He finally comes in, and he says, how was that? <laughs> Everybody conquer their fears? Uh, no, sir, but I got new ones. <clears throat> and he turned on his light, and we all laughed and had a great time. <clears throat> and they started to go down the tunnel to the next room, and I went up to that guide who was behind me, and I said, thank you. Thank you, thank you for turning on that light for me. And he said, I didn't turn that light on for you. What, what's that? We're not supposed to turn our lights on. I would never turn a light on. I said, but I saw the light. You saw the light. The people in the cave on the other side gasped. They saw the light. And he said, oh, yeah, he said, somehow... A flashlight must have fallen out of someone's pocket in that cave, and it just somehow laid on the right side, aiming at it, and it somehow turned itself on at just the right moment and shined. And when I came through the cave behind, I saw it and grabbed it and turned it off. I thought, you turned your light on, Matt. I said, how could I even get to a flashlight? My hands are above my head. And he said, you didn't do that? I'm like, you didn't do that? It's, this is it. It's still dust. You can't even turn it on. There's no way. It's a recessed button. It just happened to be laying on the side. It just happened to be on the right side that could shine into the one depression. It just happened to turn itself on at just the last moment. God met me in that cave, and he provided something that I didn't even know I needed. This is God's omnipresence. He is there. He is real. And I would think sometimes we just blow off stuff that he does all the time, and we just say, oh, that's a nice coincidence. Sometimes God does amazing things, and we just need to stop and pause and say, God, you are amazing. I stand in awe. When we look at Isaiah, there's this great verse, there's this hint where he, he kind of understands what's about to come, God's omnipresence, and he says, you're actually going to call him Emmanuel. You know what God means when you, when you translate Emmanuel? It's God with us. Don't miss this. This prophecy is pointing to the wonderful truth that God is with us. Maybe you're here today and you've been running from God. You think, ah, oh, man, I'm hiding from God. I don't want to be around. I know my past. I've done some stuff. I want to tell you something. There is nothing you've done so big that God cannot forgive. Nothing. His grace is that vast. Your job is to bring it to him and confess it, to repent. He takes care of the rest. You cannot outrun God. Anybody have pets? Don't you love it when you come home and you know your pets have done something wrong? And they, they come up to you and like, they, you just felt like, I did something bad. You could just tell, like, uh-huh. And it's almost hilarious, like, they try to hide from you. Y'all, just like your pets try to hide from you and they can't, we cannot hide from God. He is everywhere. And that should cause us to stand in awe and wonder. He is always near. The last lesson for David is he's telling you guys, do not lose the awe of the Lord's omnipotence. His omnipotence. This is just a big fancy word that means he is all powerful. And here, David could have described the awesomeness of God by pointing to the galaxies and the wonders he paints on the canvas of the night sky, but he doesn't. He does something odd. He goes the other way. Instead of going huge, he goes microscopic. And he starts to choose on the, the miracle of life through conception and birth. 
Man, you want to talk about wonder? Look at these next verses with me, starting in verse 13. He says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Life. Talk about the wonder of wonders. Guys, this is long before microscopes. Here's David talking about two microscopic forms of protoplasm that come together and form human life with a nervous system and DNA and cells and your digestive system and a respiratory system, which I have become intimately familiar with from that cave. As you breathe in and the wonder of lungs and oxygen and how this works in a heart, in a mind, in a soul, in a spirit. What a testimony that the God himself of the universe decided to lovingly form you. Life is a gift. This is why Christians are so, so vocal about the miracle of life. We're the ones who have come and when the world was sacrificing children, you always say, we're the ones that came and attached new life to birth. Now, this is not a political statement. You know I me, mean, I don't care. I'm an equal opportunity offender. I don't care what your political party is. When you die, the creator of all matter is not going to look at you, hey, what was your party affiliation? <laughs> He's not going to ask that. But I tremble that he might ask me, why was I silent for those who were defenseless? Why did I not speak up for the single moms, the orphans, the widows, the unborn? Why did I not say anything? Guys, we, we may answer for a lot, but one thing I hope we are never accused of is being silent when standing up for defenseless, helpless people who have no voice. Right here in these verses, David has staked out your worth. Did you know that? He has tapped the corners. He has poured the concrete. Here is your foundation for life right there. Wrap your head around that. The same God who made these stars in this next picture, the same God who calls them by name knows your name. The same God who did all these incredible, wonderful things. God knew each one of us. He made every cell in our body. And he said, it is fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you stand in awe of that? I'm going to invite our instrumentalists back up. And I want you to think about this. God thinks about you all the time. In fact, Scripture says he thinks of you at all times. He is madly, head over heels, crazy about you. And I think sometimes we forget that truth. I think sometimes we forget that. And this should cause us to stop and stand in awe. And then lastly in the Scripture... In verse 14, after describing the wondrous gloriousness of God's omnipotence and conception of a child and, and all of his amazing creativity powers, he says, I will praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God knows us. He's with us. He is powerful. But then he does something strange, and he ends this psalm on this note of vulnerability. This vulnerable note is so rare and so refreshing. He says, God, I invite you to search me. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. And then check this out. He says, point out anything in me that offends you and lead me on the path to everlasting life. Wow. What about us? Have we given God that permission? That's your challenge. You've been a Christian for a long time? Here's your challenge today. Give God a chance. Marvel at David's obedience and say, Lord, I give you permission here and now to search me. Try me. Know me. Know my anxious thoughts. Lead me. Guys, we can be in no better hands. When the creator of all matter says, you matter, that is good news. Maybe you just needed a reminder of his awe today. Maybe you don't know the Savior at all. Today, I would love nothing more than to be the one to introduce you to this magnificent God. Would you bow with me right where you are? Just tune out the distractions. Just make right where you are an altar. And just tell the Lord your heart. Father, we marvel. For those in this uh, room, Lord, or listening online that don't know you, I pray that this would be their moment of introduction where we would say, God, I confess you as Lord. 
Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are. I believe you rose from the dead and paid for my sin. Holy Spirit, would you invade my world now? Would you take control? I give you full ownership rights. I surrender to your Lordship. Now, Lord, help me walk 180 degrees in repentance, the opposite direction. We believe in our heart that you were raised from the dead. We confess with our mouth, and we claim the scriptures that we'll be saved. Thank you for making me a new creation. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. If you're new here, we like to kind of just have a moment of final worship together where God just speaks to us. No one's going to bother you. We're going to stand. We're going to have the words to one last song. The altar will be open. You'll see some people coming and praying. If you want to just pour out your heart to the Lord, maybe just kneel before him and just to cry, just to cry out how holy and awesome he is. Maybe you want to make right where you are a place of worship and altar. God is here. His word is spoken. Just be obedient. Let's stand together. The words are on the screen. The altar is open. You come. Be obedient to what the Lord leads you to do in this time. You can be seated just for one second. I want to share with you a couple new things coming. Hopefully, in your chair this morning, you can receive a devotional. A lot of you have been waiting for that. The next quarter's here. Use that. Share that with a friend. If you need more, let us know. Um, we also have some other great small group things that are coming up. There should be one in there that talks about Marriage Up, which is a date night coming up. We're going to show you just a quick 60-second video. This is going to be something great, something new. Many of you have said, I'm tired of doing these same old boring dates, and your marriage needs a little jump start. Or if you're dating, or if maybe you're engaged or something, this is a great time to come together to have a lot of laughs. You're going to see some games played in it. It's going to be a fun two-hour time together. Tickets will go on sale to help kind of pay for the cost of this. We're trying something different. We would love for you to bring, uh, bring your spouse and, and share this and support this so we can do more of these things. So I'm going to show it us here, and then I think we'll be dismissed after that. is like your waistline. If you don't pay attention to it, it will drift in a direction you don't want it to go. You're broken, I'm broken, but we're gonna, we're gonna walk through life together in commitment. And we're gonna love each other in spite of and through the brokenness to wholeness. That was the most I've heard guys say amen in church. <laughs> 